and you can change the hardware, etc. That means you can extend the life of the system or the observing um, instrument. Strong offer lines that are a little bit in visible range with good diagnostics uh, for flares and solar eruptions, and that is what uh, people have been doing in the past, uh, taking uh, observations in calcium in HL for studying the chromosphere, uh, solar chromosphere, chromospheric activity. There is no telemetry constraint. The, therefore, you can have high cadence observations and analysis can be easily performed. There is no telemetry delays. So the data is accessible in real time. Oh, and to overcome the night, uh, day night cycle, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we can have a network of, of observatories so that you can uh, you know, continuously observe the sun, avoiding the uh, nighttime gaps. There is low vulnerability to space weather effects. We know that if you have instruments in space, they can be um, damaged by by the particles that come with the uh, with the eruptions. So there, uh, if you have a system on the ground, you protect yourself from these uh, problems. And also, they also serve as a pathway for developing future space-based instruments. So you can uh, do an experiment. So there are advantages of having ground-based over space-based. Of course, space-based has its advantages that we will come to later. So how can you observe the sun? Uh, uh, apart from ground and based, I mean, it, it doesn't matter, but you, you have two kinds of observations. One is to see, uh, to look at the sun as a, as a full disk or takes in optic observations in multi-wavelengths, then you can study the sun as an active star. But if you want to uh, understand the mechanisms that are uh, at work in the active sun, we need to probe the sun in very high resolution. So on the left, you see um, an SDU HMI full disk image that is taken from the um, space-based instrument, that is full disk image. And you see a very large active region or a group of sunspots, uh, which uh, we at uh, Udaipur Solar Observatory have observed in high resolution uh, from our 50 centimeter aperture telescope, and then you start seeing the uh, details of the sunspots. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we can get around uh, with the problem of nighttime gaps by having a, an observational network which is ground based. And so it was realized very early that we need such kind of a network of ground based observatories in 1957-98, which was International Geophysical Year. At that time, we started to uh, begin uh, with a network. And, uh, and the, at the end of the 1955, already data from various observatories uh, around the globe were compiled and uh, and, uh, you know, in one solar geophysical data bulletin, which uh, used to come in yellow book form until 2009. So that was a kind of network established early on. And uh, later on, there are two, there are two now operating um, network of, of observatories to monitor solar activity. One is global high resolution HLMA network that is led by NJIT. And the other is uh, National Solar Observatory-led uh, um, network, which is Global Oscillation Network Group, of which Udaipur uh, forms uh, a part. So I come, uh, um, I come to the uh, data archive from the Kodaikanal Solar Observatory. As I mentioned in the beginning, this uh, observatory was found long ago in 1899, and continuous solar observations were taken. And we now have a good archive of more than 100 years, uh, with, uh, the longest uh, series of solar data. Not only does it have the longest series, but also in multi-wavelength, uh, different wavelengths that make it more special than any other site in the world. So we have observations in alpha, calcium K, and white light. Uh, these are three um, wavelengths in which disk images have been taken and these all have been digitized and put up on the Kodaikanal uh, Solar Observatory Archive and this give you, gives you an, a unique opportunity to study the long-term effect of solar activity uh, in different wavelengths. So here is the website and the four uh, different 
uh, images uh, are uh, shown on the right. Uh, the one on the left is top left is the um, uh, is the sunspot data or the photospheric uh, image. On the right, uh, top right is the uh, calcium image, and on the lower left is H alpha image. The right is the uh, uh, is the is the chromospheric picture of prominences uh, by covering the disk of the sun you start seeing the fainter structure in the outer chromosphere as uh, bright regions and those have been also recorded and kept as um, on the archive so these are uh, some of the details of uh, the timeline of all the images that have been kept um, for the global community to use. A lot of papers have uh, been written and very good scientific uh, output has come from this uh, very precious uh, archive. Um, I am going to show it doesn't mean that there are not, uh, there are other results which are not of importance. This is the most recent. I thought it, I should show that uh, the data for 90 years was analyzed uh, covering several uh, solar cycles. And um, what they found uh, is that radiation profiles of sunspots with area which have less than 200 millions of uh, hemisphere of the solar disk, uh, they have um, lesser, um, they have the higher uh, rotation rate compared to the ones that, that are uh, larger in area, that is greater than 400 millions of solar disk area. So this is an important result and they found that this, this doesn't change with the solar cycle. So it's kind of inherent. So this means that probably uh, the the larger sunspot areas are probably um, anchored deeper into the photosphere and th therefore the rotation rate is slow. Now I come to the network, uh, uh, six site network uh, with identical instruments was uh, proposed by the National Solar Observatory and it started operating in 1995. These are the six stations that are having identical instruments at Mauna Loa in Hawaii, Big Bear in California, Hawaii in India, Leon in Australia and Soro Tulalo and LTD in Chile and uh, Tenerife respectively. So these are um, are almost a 60 degree longitude apart so that they cover the nighttime gaps. And initially, it was meant to do helioseismic studies, that is, the study of solar oscillations. So it was intended to, intended to um, uh, look at the or uh, investigate the solar interior, uh, what um, the flows inside the sun, and uh, how they manifest themselves in the uh, photosphere uh, or the outer layer. Uh, all these studies were done, were supposed to be done with Kong. And now, after 26 uh, uh, years of operation, in between in 2010, um, H-alpha imaging was also introduced in this work. Although they had only Doppler grams and magnetic magnetograms for, for the Gong network stations initially, uh, HL, introducing H-alpha images uh, made this useful for uh, for a lot of space for the applications. And here I show uh, a full image from the image from the gong station, uh, um, which shows a lot of uh, filaments. And this became an important, uh, important study uh, or uh, important uh, effort to uh, use them for space weather studies. So this um, uh, full disk image is a 2K by 2K image with a resolution of 1.06 arc second and the frequency or the cadence of the taking images is one per minute. So it's very fast and can be used for real time uh, forecasting purposes. So here's an example of how one can use filament eruptions uh, for space weather uh, studies. Uh, one of the ICER uh, students um, so if Subhadeep Sinha has done this work, uh, he has uh, made a code for uh, extracting the filaments out of the full disk and uh, that is an automatic code and has applied to several, uh, several such cases where the filaments erupted. And uh, by looking at the area of these um, erupting filaments, uh, one can uh, estimate the time of uh, time of uh, disappearance or the eruption of the filament in H alpha. And he found that the indicate of quiescent filaments can be um, uh, can be linked to 
to the speed of the seas where when they found when he found the correlation coefficient is about 0.75 and not only uh, the, the decay rate indicate the eruption of the filament and or the onset of the eruption of filament uh, but it also uh, they found the time day of uh, of solar flares compared to the eruptive filament. So there was a, a small delay um, when you compare the solar flare onset and that implies that filament eruption can be used as one of the precursors for the occurrence of solar flare and hence a CME which appears later. So here is the uh, image that uh, has been chosen for the flare uh, onset time which is uh, AIA 90 francs from channel where you can see the uh, uh, flares associated with filaments in a much uh, more uh, pronounced way compared to other uh, channels of the AIA and uh, they found that this study then becomes very useful for space uh, weather assessment because CME is occurred within two hours from the start time of the filament eruption. So and, and any ensuing CME uh, can be uh, forecasted in uh, beforehand if you look at filament activation and the eruption uh, before. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, Gong instrument was initially meant to do helioseismic uh, studies, that is the study of solar oscillations. Now the, it is serving as a uh, as an important um, instrument for real time space weather forecast. Uh, it is working since 1995, almost 26 years have passed, and the duty cycle is above 91% uh, the, for the observations. And uh, Gong magnetograms are being used as input for the uh, NOAA Space Weather Prediction Center. Basically, they use magnetograms that are taken in, uh, from the Gong instrument in near real time, and uh, it is fed into the uh, WSA Angel model, which is a 3D uh, model for uh, for the propagation of CMEs in the heliosphere. And basically, they make the forecast of the solar wind properties, density and uh, velocity, etc., from 0.2 to 2 AU. So, you, uh, the, in this way, uh, the ground instrument or the ground based network has helped to uh, do the real time space weather forecast. Um, again, uh, there's an important uh, problem, uh, as um, most of you know that. Uh, we want to predict the uh, based weather event and what will be the magnitude of the event at the Earth and what will be its, uh, when will it arrive at the Earth. These are the two important parameters um, to predict uh, regarding the space weather event. However, it is, uh, although there are many models that can uh, predict the arrival time of CMEs uh, within a uh, few hours of the actual arrival time, uh, the model works well. But the basic problem is, is a real, um, uh, or the predicting the southward component of interplanetary magnetic field that is associated with the CME is much more difficult to do. And uh, there are several um, um, models there. And the very fact that there are several models, that means that there are several approaches, uh, both um, magnetohydrodynamic model, numerical model, and also empirical model, and none of them are, are uh, giving a very accurate prediction of the BZ. And the problem is that you don't have the coronal magnetic field measurement. So the linking in the solar photosphere to the heliospheric magnet magnetic field is not very clear and thus there is a scope of uh, modeling, empirical modeling, and numerical modeling and real observations to be made in this regime. So, um, so this sets the stage for the new generation Gong proposal um, which has already been proposed by a National Solar Observatory of US to, uh, as a replacement of the Global Oscillation Network Group, Gong. And uh, this will uh, be uh, will be again a six or even more uh, sites network. And basically, uh, the effort will be to uh, to measure the magnetic field um, and provide the connectivity from the photosphere uh, solar surface to the heliosphere. And uh, not only just provide the magnetic field, but also provide the 3D magnetic uh, topology of these uh, erupting. Uh, 
uh, which uh, we know that they uh, move in the form of uh, rather than the form of magnetic flux rope. So, uh, structure of magnetic flux rope combined with the magnitude of the magnetic field will be able uh, will give us a, a better handle on the prediction of the Z problem. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there are two groups in operation, and th this is just to uh, uh, let you know that there is a global high resolution H alpha network wherein nine different observatories are participating. They are not, uh, I, they are, do not have identical instruments, so their dense and their formats of the images are different, but they are able to cover the nighttime gaps and provide complementary data. So, um, so now I come to the high resolution observations of the sun when you want to look at the uh, active region or sunspots or filaments in detail. Then you have uh, these three projects. Um, the two of them I have listed from Indian um, uh, efforts. That is multi-application solar telescope, which is a 50 centimeter uh, telescope at Udaipur Solar Observatory. And there is a proposed two meter national large solar te telescope, which is led by Indian Institute of Astrophysics. I also wanted to mention uh, the uh, Neil K. Inouye Solar Telescope, DKIST, which is a four meter uh, solar telescope, which is, which is the largest telescope, uh, solar telescope and is in a commissioning phase. It is started taking some uh, observations during commission phase. And it will. it is very promising, at least from the ground uh, observation point of view, to look at the small field of uh, small, uh, in the small um, field of view, but with high resolution of the order of uh, about uh, you know, 25 kilometers on solar surface. But I come to the multi-application solar telescope of UNESCO. It became operational in 2015 and is uh, located in the iron site of the of our observatory. It has different instruments for imaging uh, and so um, uh, imaging in different wavelengths and simultaneous uh, imaging in uh, photosphere and chromosphere in G band. Alpha. Then we also have uh, tunable narrowband imager and polarimeter to do the magnetic field measurement in different uh, layers of the sun in the photosphere and chromosphere. Um, so I want to mention that um, uh, we also have an adaptive optic system to do the seeing correction, which takes care of the turbulences and uh, and the the uh, improves the quality of the image that we take uh, for a small field of view. And uh, that is how we can connect uh, or, or, you know, um, make it uh, more usable or uh, more quantitative measurements or accurate measurements can be made for magnetic field, basically magnetic field and Doppler measurements. And we also have a state spectrograph to produce spectral maps of active region, including magnetic field maps. So the, uh, the multi-application solar telescope has a three arc field of view and 0.1 arc second of uh, spatial sampling. So these are some of the images uh, that have been taken by uh, the application for telescope at USO. And this is a three arc minute. It's not the full sun, it's only uh, one tenth of the sun, uh, which is uh, observed by, by multi-application solar telescope. Below, we show the uh, capture images, uh, chromospheric image, uh, uh, and uh, the iron uh, strokes I and strokes V profile taken for the magnetic field of the sunspot. So different uh, uh, polarities are uh, seen as different colors, black and white. So now um, you don't have to look at the whole um, image or whole slide here. I just wanted to point out uh, that uh, Multi-application solar telescope also provides context images for any study that do with any so any instrument. And in fact, uh, there was uh, a big active region 12192 on on the surface of the sun in October, which gave rise to several several X-class flares. But oh, there was only one uh, which was uh, related to uh, CME, and. Uh, in, uh, in this case, since we could observe in high resolution, we saw that for the eruptive flare, the penumbral area decreased very rapidly and the 
that meant that uh, the decay of the crystal magnetic field was very fast uh, compared to the flares that were confined and did not give rise to CMEs. So uh, it, it gives important information in the form of uh, uh, morphological um, uh, uh, Morphological uh, information in the uh, in the must uh, uh, HRM and G band images. So uh, I mentioned about an adaptive optic system with uh, is uh, used with multi application solar telescope as QSO. Uh, this is uh, operating and uh, this is working since October 2020 uh, for the neural band spectroparameter. And a lot of data is being taken for both the layers for sphere and uh, chromosphere 617.3 and 854.2 nm in the uh, chromosphere. And I think I have an image to show um, that um, this is actually uh, locking the sunspots and improving the quality of the image. Yes, there's a movie. So on the left uh, is the as has been gathered from the telescope, and this is of. Uh, adaptive optics correction. So I come to the National Large Solar Telescope. It is a proposed uh, project of two meter aperture and that is led by IIA and which will be com coming up in Lay region and Merak. And um, this uh, is going to uh, be better off compared to what we have at Udaipur right now. The two meter uh, of axis uh, on axis telescope and its um, scientific objectives are to again look at the in high resolution the sub arc second magnetic elements so that one can uh, see the complexity of the active regions and the variation that takes place before the eruptions or any activity is where it is detected and um, um, this is a uh, this is also should be realized on a shorter time scale once approved and it will also be uh, keeping the costs down. So basic uh, scientific is, as I mentioned, they are all the same for all the telescopes because these are the main questions uh, for the solar physicists to answer. Basically, what is the magnetic uh, field generation, how it takes place in the solar inside the surface of the sun, and how the coupling between the interior and the outer solar uh, atmosphere takes place. Um, we also would like to know what, uh, uh, what, uh, how the coronal heating takes place, um, and uh, what is the thermal structure of the chromosphere, and energetic phenomena in the form of uh, flares, uh, eruptive filaments, and steam. So this is the basically the picture or the schematic of the telescope that is going to be built um, at uh, Meruk, and um, it is having a broadband imaging system in HFR, calcium K, and D band, and then it will also have a tunable fabric neuron aperture and a high resolution spectropolarimeter. Now I come to the Daniel uh, KIC telescope, at, which will be at uh, uh, located, which is located at Hawaii. It's a multi-institutional and a very expensive project and a four-meter telescope. It aims to look at the features, which will be about 25 kilometers in size, and it has a good signal-to-noise ratio. Uh, again, it has a multi-line diagnostic. It is a very sensitive spectral parameter to give the accurate uh, values of magnetic field. And it was also equipped with the instrument to have coronal off-limb observations so that magnetic mapping of coronal regions can be done and magnetic field can be measured. So these are some of the instruments. Uh, just to mention that it has uh, for spectral parameter, it has a two by two net field of view. And for the uh, the filter uh, images, it has a one arc minute field of view. And the print uh, spectral coverages uh, are in the uh, mostly in the optical and also in near infrared. And all of the instruments will be fed adaptive optics so that the atmospheric turbulence can be taken care of. Besides optical instruments that I mentioned, uh, Radio instruments uh, are also very useful for monitoring space weather and um, 
uh, solar activity. So here at U the solar observatory, we have an e calisto which is a um, low cost frequency instrument for spectroscopy and transportable uh, observatory, which works in the range of 45 megahertz to about 870 megahertz, and is useful for monitoring real monitoring solar storms in the radio band. So this is an example of the solar storm that was observed on October 2021 uh, and which produced these bright um, patches are the multiple shock waves that were associated with the solar storm. So um, I mentioned about the uh, nighttime gaps and, uh, uh, and uh, the way to go about is to have a uh, network of sites but we can also observe the sun from Antarctica and uh, because uh, in summer months the sun does set so you can uh, make up for the nighttime gaps and observe continuously and one such instrument that is operating uh, at in the in the Antarctic is moth instrument um, which uh, aims at uh, studying the evolution of solar surface and reconstructing the three dimension three di dimension dynamic model by, uh, by taking magnetic and velocity map that they are mostly line of sight magnetic field at different heights of the solar atmosphere. Right now, they are using for two uh, two heights, uh, uh, one at 400 and the other at uh, 700 kilometers by using sodium and potassium uh, lines. So having discussed about the ground-based and its importance and what way we can study uh, different aspects of solar activity, uh, I would like to share uh, some of the um, uh, highlights of space-based observations. Of course, uh, everybody knows the solar and heliospheric observatory has revolutionized our understanding of the sun and the heliosphere, which was uh, uh, an observatory launched in 1995 uh, at L1, and it had several instruments. And um, for the first time, we could make one-to-one -one connection between the mass ejections that took place from the sun to the Earth and uh, a lot, lot of, of information, information was gathered. gathered. Soon, Soon after, uh, so a solar dynamic observatory was launched, which was, uh, uh, which was uh, having vector magnetic field observations, and uh, also he had uh, this uh, uh, capability. And it also had several uh, images in different uh, channels. UV channels, which could give, uh, which could give, give information about the transition region and coronal um, regions to know about the initiation of CMEs and the source region of of um, eruptions. Uh, after that, in 2000, uh, in fact, before that, uh, stereo uh, 2000 stereo was launched in 2006. Uh, and that also revolutionized our understanding of coronal mass ejections, basically in um, getting the 3D view of the eruptions and uh, also getting the true uh, speeds and true, true directions of the propagating CMEs. And I will come briefly discuss a little bit of uh, their uh, results. And now recently we have Parker Solar Probe, which is... Uh, which is uh, almost touching the sun, as you say, uh, it goes very close to the sun, uh, very close up to about 15 solar radii or so. So uh, I, I would not go into details about this. So oh, I have already mentioned that a lot of knowledge has been gained and um, about the uh, about how to connect the features that come out from the surface of the sun to the features that uh, are received at the Earth or at, at L1 point, and different models were um, used to fill the gap in between. But Stereo was the one which uh, almost connected any uh, that took place on the surface of the sun to uh, to the Earth, and because of the imaging capability of this imager. Um, so, uh, here are uh, the field of view of different uh, uh, coronal gaps and the connecting geospheric metals which have overlapping field of view and uh, the EMEs seen passing through the Earth. So this is a very interesting uh, observation and different vantage points in fact help us to do stereoscopy of the same CME because the uh, stereo A and B were moving 
at uh, about 44 degrees uh, per year. And uh, so this could give you um, uh, uh, a, a, a tap, you could attempt to do the 3D stereoscopy and get the true speed direction and get an improvement on the arrival time of the CMEs as such. Uh, what was sorry, five minutes. Okay. So, what was more interesting uh, uh, from these observations that one could even see that uh, the CMEs interacting with planetary medium or the, between the sun and earth. And we could follow the tracks of such CMEs and see where they interacted and how they behaved after the interactions. I would just go to the in situ observations and uh, arrival time of interacting CMEs, which showed that um, the two CMEs, CME1 and CME2, they arrived separately, but they had an intera interesting interaction region between, um, uh, which had a very typical uh, compressed region in between uh, between them. So interactions can lead to um, strong geoeffectiveness, uh, which can be seen at the Earth, and therefore it is very important to track any CME from the Sun to the Earth, and stereo has played an important role in uh, letting us understand this aspect. So as I mentioned in the beginning, the ma major problem is to predict BZ, and there are several uh, approaches to do that. Basically, all the approaches that uh, one takes is to constrain the CME flux stroke model using sun observations, which are available from um, the dynamics observatories and uh, which has different uh, um, full major and also coronavirus. And then one has to uh, uh, constrain the background a little bit from the solar magnetic of the surface uh, and then propagate the CME as a flux probe in this background magnetic field and compare the observations and models by using either semi analytical or empirical medical simulations. Uh, this is a, a very interesting uh, study that uh, we have been conducting to, uh, to a model or data about model that we have developed uh, for sequentially observed ICs by different uh, multiple spacecraft. And by uh, implementing the model, we can uh, see in each case a different. Uh, Results are obtained, particularly for isolated ICME evolution. It is model fits very well. But when the ICMEs are followed uh, by high speed streams by another CME, then the model does work well. So all we need is better observation and better modeling capability to uh, get the um, BZ component or the software component field correct at work. I also want to talk about cells. Uh, these are the CMEs which leave no surf activity at the at the um, at the sun, and uh, they can be also can also lead to problematic geomagnetic storm because you don't have anything seen on the sun. So um, they are very um, pain structures, very narrow, and probably they come from higher um, uh, height in the corona, and that's why probably they don't leave any signatures in the form of dimming or uh, flare or wave structure on the surface. Uh, so I won't uh, discuss these things, but uh, this is also very interesting trends uh, to look at uh, when you don't see anything on the surface of the sun. So how do you um, uh, find out the, uh, its speed and its direction or the source region? And then it becomes tough to predict the Z component of such CMEs. So <clears throat> I come to the last part of my talk is about Parker Solar Probe. And Parker Solar Probe, as you all know, I've said in the beginning, it is making uh, making uh, discoveries because of its um, because of its very uh, novel uh, uh, capability of going through the solar wind very close to the sun and actually intercepting uh, the solar wind and uh, taking measurements. There are several instruments aboard Parker Solar. One of the main highlights of the uh, of this uh, uh, instrument or uh, this uh, spacecraft result was uh, observation of feedback in solar wind. And um, this was um, direct measurement of the magnetic field very close to the sun, wherein you expected it to behave uh, like, uh, like an envelope or uh, to have a curved thing. But in fact, the magnetic field was 
um, going back and forth from positive to negative, which is called the switchback. And for this switchback to happen, uh, some models or some theories have been given that there should be some uh, kink in this uh, magnetic field line, which um, which people believe has come uh, from the surface. And because of uh, uh, reconnection happening close to the sun between the open and field line, uh, you get this kind of kinks very close to the sun. And uh, there are lots of observations, and uh, uh, Parker has been giving such kind of uh, observations, which is, which is of interest to people who are trying to understand the solar origin of wind, uh, the origin of the solar wind acceleration. Lastly, uh, I would like to discuss uh, briefly mention about Aditya mission of ISRO. Uh, is going to be the first mission of uh, ISRO uh, to look at the sun and it will be going at L1 point and it also has several instruments starting from coronograph to uh, imager uh, solar photosphere, chromosphere in near ultraviolet and uh, solex to monitor the X-ray flare and the events in the corona uh, which is um, observed by heat which will by Helios, which is the X-ray spectrometer, in different energy ranges. There are particle instruments uh, which will make measurements of the solar wind in different energy ranges and in different directions. There will be magnetic field measurements of the uh, interplanetary. So in summary, this is an exciting time in solar astronomy to observe the sun both from ground and space. Uh, there are challenging questions uh, posed to our sponsor, and we need both these uh, platforms to utilize and ex ex exploiting the potential of both these platforms. Uh, we have to combine them with the models and validate them for the, uh, which are very crucial for better understanding of the sun and space weather. Thank you. Thank you, Nandita. Uh, time for questions. Uh, the first question is there in the chat box uh, from Ritesh Patel. What type of observation should be targeted in future missions to identify the source regions of the stealth CMEs? Uh, what type of observation should be targeted? Of course, yes. This is one question that is very dear to my heart, and I also don't know uh, what are the answers. But what we know about stealth CMEs is that. Um, they are very slow, very, very slow CMEs. So the way we analyze them or we, the way we uh, process the images to look at look at different stages and see uh, the question of source region i think we should be able to find out the answers if from high resolution point of view maybe must and dkst should be um, uh, helping us in future to to answer where they come from although um, uh, if they are a large scale structure then it becomes difficult because all of them have small field of view but if a narrow which they are probably, then it should be easier for us to detect. Very much, Dina, for a very good uh, overview. It's, it's, it's a task to cover in two minutes, uh, you know, uh, the uh, ground and space based uh, observation together. So, just for the benefit of the time, I would request, you know, others to post their questions in the chat box and we'll request Nandita to respond to those questions uh, in, the, in the chat box. And as the organizers mentioned that the Slack channel is also available. So please use the chat and the Slack for subsequent uh, questions and so on. And right now I do not see any more questions in the chat box. So thank you again, Nandita. Uh, thank you, Deepankar. Uh, stop sharing. And yes. Ardhudeep, uh, Paul, uh, can you try to share your screen and start your presentation? I will also request uh, Shirish and uh, Shovik, uh, later speakers, to identify themselves so that you know you can be made presenter. So, I, are my slides visible now? Yeah, uh, please go ahead and uh, make your presentation. I will okay. continue after three minutes for three minutes. Okay. 
So, hello everyone, I'm Mark Hodi, and the topic for my presentation today is magnetic connection and particle acceleration in high Lundquist number systems and from a coronal and a magnetospheric perspective. So, firstly, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present my work. So, this work has been done uh, in collaboration with Dr. Bhargav Mehta. So, magnetic reconnection is a process that is responsible for energy conversion and other acceleration in astrophysical paths. Uh, in the perspective, magnetic reconnection has been directly observed in near sun environments such as the solar corona, like the image you see here on the left. Not only that, the magnetic reconnection process has also been observed in near Earth environments such as the Earth's magnetosphere. And such observations show that reconnection is quite prevalent in the magnetic as well as the magnetic tail region of Earth, and all these evidences highlight the ubiquity of the process. And there has been certain theories put forward to explain reconnection. Two of them are the well-known Sweet Parker model and the Peschek model. But this model predict a reconnection rate that is too uh, for high Lundquist number current sheets, like the ones you really see in the corona as well as the magnetosphere. These models predict a very slow reconnection rate that deals even as the Lundquist number increases. So, the theory on plasmoid instability by Bhattacharya at all can appear that predicts that a such thing and long current will rapidly break down into numerous plasma bobs or plasmoids due to reconnection. This is called the plasmoid instability and it is known to produce reconnection rates that are well beyond the Sweet Parker and the Peschek model predictions. And these plasmoids have been observed in simulations, uh, observed in situ, and also have been directly imaged. So, these kind of plasmoid unstable regions are prime location plus magnetic reconnection and particle acceleration. And due to the inherent turbulence associated with the process, it is quite common that a velocity shear is present near the current sheets. Also, it is possible that multiple current sheets to each other. So, I have divided my discussion today into two parts. Firstly, I shall discuss the results of our studies on the effects of a parallel velocity shear on reconnection and particle acceleration in a plasmoid unstable double current sheet system. And the parameters used in this particular study is this in view relevant to the solar core. And this has been done in a 2D slab geometry. But we also have to consider that reconnection is inherently a three dimensional process, and adding a third dimension also adds additional complexity. So, as a follow up, we'll talk about our global three dimensional resistive energy simulations or Lord's magnetopause using mesh refinement and discuss with you some interesting initial results we obtained regarding the formation and evolution of plus transfer events or FTEs, which are formed due to bursty reconnection. So FTEs are essentially the 3D extension of plasmoids that we generally see in V. So let me get into the first question here. So we have a double current system like so, and with the wall. So what happens is that we have two lower one over here, and then the portion in the middle is moving towards the right, and the top and the bottom portion is moving towards the they have a velocity in opposite direction, which actually creates velocity shear along this current sheet and this current sheet. So the panel to the right is during a later time. Uh, the large magnetic islands have grown quite a bit in size, and you can also see multiple parts forming around current sheets here and here. With the size distribution of the plasmas from the center the power law. And then we did a study on how the reaction rate behaves with an increase in shear. If we focus on the left panel below, this panel shows the scaling at an earlier time when the plasma instead does not develop. And that shows the theoretical reaction rate and the rest from simulation. So we see that the scaling is followed well. But if we focus on the right panel this here, this is after the plasma instability started. If we focus on just the blue hexagons, we see that there is a significant deviation for higher shears over here in these two points. So we have found that this is due to the fact that in such a double current sheet system, the large magnetic have a feedback effect on each other, which means that this particular magnetic island tends to push magnetic flux towards this current sheet, and the same goes for this magnetic island as well as this current sheet. So that is why if the systems have larger plasmoids, this feedback effect is more. And it so happens that the setups with lesser shears have larger plasmoids. And this enhances the reconnection rate for such setups. And the higher shear speeds, which are these ones, are left behind. To confirm this, we actually measured the reconnection rate of the two setups that deviate, this and this one, uh, during a time when the plasmoid sizes are. And we see that good agreement is again retrieved, plotted here with the triangles, this and this point. 
So to study the effect of a shear on the process of particle acceleration in the system, we then introduce particles into the system just before the plasma instability starts. So on the graph to the left, I have plotted the energy spectrum. Also for all these plots, blue color stands for the setup with no shear and red color stands for the setup with quite high shear of 0.75 times the alpha speed. We see that the spectrum tends to evolve into a steady power law with an index of minus 1.24. Interestingly, the presence of a shear has no effect on the spectral index of the particles. It, however, does truncate the high energy tail at a much lower value. So, to investigate this further, we look into the energization of two particles from two different setups, one corresponding to this red curve to the left and one corresponding to the blue curve. So, we plot this in-plane energy given by EIP in the top right and the out-of-plane energy given as EOP at the bottom right in the same colors as that to the left. So the in-plane energization occurs when the particle process off of moving magnetic structures in the system, and the out-of-plane energy is mainly due to the electric field. That both the in-plane and the out-of-plane energization is less than the setup with a shear, and you can, as you can see, uh, the same from the red curves in both the plots shoots to much lower values than the blue curve. And we have found that the acceleration processes are overall less efficient in the presence of a shear. And this is the reason that the high energy tail of the spectrum is truncated at a smaller energy. Next, I move on to our studies on magnetic reconnection in more complex 3D systems. So, global MHD refers to the simulation of the entire magnetosphere of the Earth, and capturing reconnection in global MHD comes with its own challenges. So first of all, it's the difference in scale. The domain size has to be quite large to capture the entire magnetosphere. For example, our simulation has an almost 200 arc domain. But the problem is that the FTEs formed due to reconnection, which we want to capture, are of this sub earth size, and reconnection occurs even at smaller scales. So we have to have a resolution of well below 0 0.1 Earth radius. So for this, we we'll leverage the adaptive mesh refinement strategy, which refines the computational mesh wherever a higher resolution is desired. The second challenge comes from the presence of a dipolar magnetic field of a planet. The problem with a dipolar field is that it has a huge variation in magnitude over a distance, owing to its uh, inverse cube dependence. And any such huge differences in magnitude is difficult for a computational code to handle. And to tackle this, we have used a split field configuration where the total magnetic field is divided into a static background dipolar component B0 and a perturbation B1. We assume that B0, which is the dipole magnetic field, remains relatively constant, and then only B1 is evolved by the code. Then there is the balance between accuracy and robustness. So higher order schemes tend to be more accurate, but also tend to produce diminished returns after a certain point. So I will not get into much details here, but we have used a second order accurate TPD schemes and have also kept the set of extremely world so that it can adapt robustly to a huge range of input parameters. Here I describe the MSD setup we built using the protocol. The domain size is 160 by 200 by 200 IE. And we have used adaptive mesh refinement with four refinement levels in a 2x, 2x, 4x, 4x hierarchy. This means that if wherever need is, the grid is refined in this hierarchy manner as shown to the right. For simplicity, I have shown 2D grids here, but in 3D, one grid cell will split into eight grid cells for the 2x refinement, and for a 4x refinement, the already refined grid cell will be further split into 64 smaller cells in the format shown here. And this leads to a finest resolution of 0 0.04 RE at the magnetopause for our setups. Uh, we have a dipole tilt of 5 degrees and the solar wind inflow boundary conditions are given at the left boundary with all other boundaries set to be 0 gradient. Uh, for this particular study, we have a constant solar wind speed of 400 km per second. The mesh refinement criteria is said to be the current density J. That means wherever the port sees a sharp gradient in J, it will refine that region to a higher resolution. Here I show the adaptation in action. The left snapshot is that of the entire domain, and I have zoomed into a region from this on the right that will show you how the mesh, how the mesh adapts. Here the colored boxes and the alignment levels in the hierarchy format I talked about earlier. The legend for the scene is given in the midpoint here. And as you can see, in JS refinement criteria does did refine the region of interest very well, which is the man pause that is uh, right around here. And the white circle is an internal boundary having a size of a 488. So kind of adaptive strategies uh, used to refine the mesh to extremely high resolutions, and this enables us to capture even the small scale responses of the Earth's magnetopause in solar wind. And as I've already mentioned before, the inflow speed of the solar wind is constant in this setup. But for such a constant speed, the magnetopause appears to be very dynamic. I will show you a movie in these two panels. The color here is a special in nanopascals. 
left one is the slice of the xz plane y equal to zero, and this is the side view of the magnetopause, and the right plot shows the surface of the magnetopause, the particular surface uh, as it would appear looking from the sun towards the earth. And as you can see, the magnetopause appears quite dynamic with the plasma forming in the left panel where the arrow is. Uh, this plasma can also be seen on the right panel as pressure perturbations at around this this one. Uh, so since we have 3D setup, this plasma take the form of twisted complex flux ropes which give rise to flux transfer events at the magnetopause. So let me briefly characterize some important parameters of the flux transfer FTEs in our simulations. Firstly, the FTEs form self constantly even for a constant solar wave inflow and they are then adapted towards the north or the south and we see that most of these FTEs form within a radius of about 4 RE and the subsolar magnetopause. We also found that the maximum cross section of most of these FTEs lie within about 0.5 to 2 RE but the azimuthal extent that is the flux length uh, varies from about 1 RE to as high as 10 RE and beyond 10 RE they seem to uh, rapidly fragment into much smaller flux slopes. See, all the FTEs show a bunch of magnetic field-like structure initially and they then evolve to form more twisted and more complex flux rope like structures as you can see on the image to the right which is a 3D representation containing the dipolar field lines as well as the solar wind field lines. So this will be a bit more clear on the next slide. So the spacecrafts that offer signatures of bursary reconnection in situ, like for example these FTEs, they generally read in a coordinate system called the Magnetron or coordinate system. So the principal signature they look for are the B component, this is the component of the total magnetic field that is perpendicular to space. And the observing component shows bipolar signatures for FTEs. This is also very clear from our plot to the left, which plots the BN on the magnetopause surface itself. Here I have pointed to distinct FTEs with arrows near the middle, which you can see as red blue pairs over here and over here. So this FTE encounter a spacecraft during their movement, then the spacecraft has very clear bipolar BN signatures. Also, I show the magnetic connection or the topology of these two FTEs in the right panel and mark them with uh, similar arrows. And as you can see, uh, these are actually helical flux ropes. The complex mixture of lines intertwined from the earth as well as the solar wind. Here, the pink lines are the solar wind fields that at the northern hemisphere of the earth, the blue are the ones that are at the southern hemisphere of the earth, and the deep ones, the dipolar field lines, which are also intertwined in the form of helical flux, and the lines are the solar wind field lines. So, Eventually, these flux ropes travel northward or southwards and interact with the polar cusp, which may then have drastic impacts due to the plasma injection into the magnetosphere. Into the magnetosphere. So, I'll just summarize it. Uh, firstly, we studied the effect of a velocity shear on the explosive reconnection phase of a double current shift system. We find that the theoretical scaling of the reconnection rate with shear remains true for the explosive plasma dominated phase of the system. We also find that the presence of a shear has no effect on the spectral index of the particle shear distribution, but the acceleration processes overcome less efficient in the of shear. Secondly, we perform global MHD study in an Earth-like intermagnetopause, and resistive simulations with AMR show that even for a constant solar wind inflow, the magnetosphere appears to be quite dynamic. We capture the formation and evolution of multiple T's, which are cross stations within 2 or 3 di and azimuthal extends up to 10 or 3 di. And we see that these FTs are helical flux rope like field lines and are often azimuthal for FTs that emerge in kites. So I shall come here. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much, Autodeep, for keeping us well within time. So we have uh, amount of time for uh, questions. Request uh, participants to Dibindu uh, has uh, hands up. Can you unmute uh, the Dibindu's uh, microphone? Yeah, uh, it has been unmuted, I think. In this, to ask a question in the astronaut session, and it didn't work. Uh, so, Argudip, I enjoyed, well, I didn't get to see the full of your talk, but I enjoyed the three fourths of it that I saw. A question for you I, I enjoyed the talk very much. Um, since you're looking at flux transfer events, uh, I'm sure that helicity is also being transferred. Uh, did you by any chance try to quantify a helicity transfer from uh, the solar wind or, or the solar magnetic transients to the magnetosphere? 
not really. So over here we have a straight solar wind in flowing from the boundary. So the density, <coughs> we have done studying on the density evolution of the magnetic flux. So it is inherently difficult because what we have from simulations is the mass. The B field, but the magnetic field helicity takes into account the vector potential as well. So it is quite difficult to calculate the magnetic field helicity. But uh, what we can do is we can calculate the current helicity that is uh, J yeah. dot B. Yes. So yeah, right now we are in the process of doing the okay. how okay. how the helicity okay. evolves in the plus one. Exactly. to know that. All right. Yeah. Any my further questions? You can post your question in the chat box, or you can also raise your hand. Uh, like the Bindu did, and uh, we can unmute yourself to uh, allow you to ask the question. Nandita, uh, go ahead, Nandita. Uh, I, this is a kind of general question. I am not familiar with Pluto code, so then my question is: uh, um, uh, is 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 it uh, difficult to use? Proto code for uh, you know prediction of uh, BZ and uh, uh, solar wind velocity at L1 because we don't see much of that. We only see enlil and euphoria and other things. So why uh, is it because of its uh, you know it was uh, mostly meant for astrophysical fluids in the beginning. Now it's being used for solar as you are also doing this. So my question was related to that. Yeah, so the code is uh, the code is quite robust in general. So it can indeed be used for uh, predictions of the solar wind velocities and the uh, magnetic field component. In fact, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Pratik uh, from our lab, is exactly doing the same thing. He is characterizing the solar wind uh, speeds with using Pluto and uh, also the field information of the solar wind. He is in fact doing it. So it's okay. not that difficult. It is uh, quite uh, uh, the code is quite robust. It can be adapted actually. Okay, I, I thought it will be a little cumbersome with this adaptive mesh uh, thing uh, that you have. It might take more time to uh, to. Uh, yes. Uh, so it may not be help in operational forecasting kind of thing. That was yes, uh, the thing is that uh, we only use adaptive mesh refinement only if we require high resolutions, for example, to capture this uh, reconnection nature. Otherwise, the with static grid also. Uh, Pratik is in fact doing it currently with the static grid version of the Pluto code and it can be in fact adapted for the, okay. for those purposes. Thank you. I see the Bendu has responded in the chat box. <laughs> yes. Uh, the next question is from Arpit uh, Kumar Srivastava. How will wind speed 400 km per second affect the Pluto pause? Yes. So, uh, Something that I can think of right, right away is that uh, if we have a higher solar wind speed, then the magnetic pulse will be pushed inwards and so it will affect the, the plasma beta in that case. But uh, to keep it simple, in this study, we only have a constant solar wind speed so that we don't introduce the variables along with it. So, yeah, for simplicity purposes, we a constant solar wind. Thank you very much. So uh, may I ask you one question? Do you have any plan to include kinetic effects? Because uh, as you know, you know, yours is a full image. So the next step could be uh, including some kinetic wave effects. Yes, indeed. That is actually the long term goal of the project to include kinetic effects in certain regions where we want to uh, study the reconnection signatures. But yes, indeed, it is actually very it's quite difficult to perform to couple the MHD with uh, the kinetic codes. Thank you very much, Orgodi, for a very nice talk and all the best uh, for your future you know, endeavors. Thank you so much. Uh, can you we move to the next talk? Uh, Shish Lata Soni. Shish, can you please uh, share your screen? Shish uh, will be talking for mass ejection. Solar system. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, okay. So, okay. hopefully, my screen is visible and audible. You are audible and you can make your screen uh, full screen mode. Yeah. Is it? Is it now full screen? It is full screen now. Yeah. Thanks. Yes, Go ahead. Thank you, sir. So, this is Dr. Sheesh Lata Soni. I'm a research associate at the Space Physics uh, Laboratory at Vikram Sarabhai Space Center, ISRO. 
And the topic of my presentation for today is propagation characteristics of coronal mass ejection throughout inner solar system from multi points. The work is supervised by Dr. Shatish Thampi and Dr. Smita Thampi, ma'am, from uh, Planetary Science Branch, SPL. So, next 15 to 20 minutes, I'm going to. Uh, next 15 uh, minutes, I'm going to discuss about one twin CME, uh, twin CME event which occurred in 2012 and gave rise a, a very intense geomantic storm at Earth. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, it hit uh, almost all the inner planets of solar system. So the outlines for the presentations are uh, timeline of event, data sources, previous work on this event, uh, multivalent analysis, the proof of CME-CME interaction, their imprints at different location, the arrival estimation by models and results. This uh, work is already submitted uh, at Solar Physics, and uh, it is an under review. So, in early uh, early 2012, the active region 11429, which is located at the uh, north 17 degree and east 15 degree, was highly active and gave rise to uh, 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 ultra fast uh, two, two CMEs within the period of one hour on 7th March, and. Uh, here in the up, uh, upper image of the taken from C2 coronagraph of uh, from the last two instrument which is onboard in Soho spacecraft. And here you can see like uh, this Mars CME uh, has a wide an angle in heliosphere. This particular image, uh, this particular event was associated with X5.4 uh, class of flare, which is offered by GOES. And at the bottom image, you can see the intensity of solar flare. Uh, this, when this event uh, uh, propagates to the interplanetary medium, it interacts with uh, all the inner planets, and uh, when it reaches to Earth, it gives rise a geomagnetic storm um, uh, with a DST value of minus uh, 148 nanotesla. So, the analysis of this event, we have used uh, multiple um, wavelength and multi point uh, observations. So for multi-length analysis, we have used uh, AI and HMI uh, filter images, which is uh, uh, these instruments are on board on Solar Dynamic Observatory. And for CME imaging, we have used three spacecraft and three uh, viewpoints uh, from Studio A, Studio B, and uh, SOHO spacecraft, which is, uh, which is situated at Albert Point. And uh, for interplanetary magnetic field and solar wind data, uh, parameters, we have used uh, data obtained Days and when, which is the at only wave database. And as I already mentioned, uh, this event uh, interact with uh, uh, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Earth, and Studio B. So the data, uh, so the data and the factors uh, for these events, uh, for the imprints of these events at the various location, we have used data obtained from Messenger, Venus Express, Mars Express, uh, and Studio B. Uh, data available at AMBA website. And at last, uh, for the geomagnetic storm data, we have used systematic uh, horizontal component uh, parameters and the data obtained from the uh, worldwide data center, which is available at Kyoto website here. So, why this event was too important? So, uh, at the early time of 2012, March 2012, the alignment of uh, inner solar planets uh, uh, it was too favorable to study the CME event uh, uh, which uh, occurred on uh, Sun. Uh, so, as you can see, like uh, Messenger, Venus, Earth, they all are in line, and uh, the CME, what uh, the CME event, what we are talking about here. So one CME, there were two CME. So one CME was erupted from here, and the other CME was uh, uh, erupted in the different direction. And then when, when they propagate, they cover all this uh, heliospheric angle and uh, get interact with all the uh, inter inner solar planets. So it gave a very favorable and uh, favorable alignment, and they were give us an opportunity to. Uh, trace the CME with the multi point at, uh, in our, throughout the inner solar system. So, we are not the first who are uh, studying this event. There are few researchers who really work on that, but uh, their, research, their work was limited to the geoeffectiveness of this event only. So, one of the very important results I want to uh, show here, which is uh, done by Rollet uh, at 2014, 
what they have done they have straight a uh, circular cone cone model here to illustrate the propagation of cme and from <clears throat> and they use data from three new points stereo a stereo b and alvin from the uh, school whole asco and uh, illustrate that this is the cme1 and this is the cme2 when they got interacted uh, at uh, near corona they have a wide front wide front uh, of mars cme and uh, as you can see from the illustration that uh, the north east uh, section of uh, mars cme was interact with mercury venus and stereo b and uh, the southwest sec segment of uh, mars cme interact with earth and mars which is uh, mostly the cme2 and uh, there are few uh, work uh, the few uh, outcome from the work of Davis et al and Louis et al Louis et al they have suggested that earth that uh, the earth direct cme was cme1 but uh, after that the most at all studied by most et al pacsicorus and uh, rolet et al they have a uh, proof that uh, the C the earth direct cme was cme2 not the cme1 so to justify and clarify their results uh, we have done a multi wavelength observation and uh, here we used uh, 94 and 193 angstrom data images from i uh, i aia as you and at the very first image you can see the source location of uh, cme eruption and uh, at the d of uh, at the image d you can see when you go through the uh, view of this image, uh, eruption we can clearly see when at the time of uh, eruption of cme1 the flux slope direction was north east and uh, at time of eruption of cme2 the flux slope direction was uh, uh, southwest so to clarify the the orientation uh, a little bit more we have a uh, we have uh, fit the triple space lab gcs uh, model for this and uh, for that we have used three space lab previews Uh, studio A, Studio B, and uh, Lasco, C, C3 Borata, and by tried and tested uh, method, we have been uh, we tried over the three all all three uh, parameters uh, obtained from all three new points, and we have did this uh, orientation of C1 at the upper plan panel, and you can clearly see the uh, the direction and orientation of C1 was in the uh, northeast, and uh, at the bottom panel. the the fit is for cme2 and here we can uh, see the orientation of uh, the direction of uh, cme2 was in southwest direction so that's all for the orientation of cmes and propagation of cme so next we uh, try to trace out the imprints of these uh, mars cme this twin cme at the different planets and space craft so uh, after the after four hour of cme occurrence uh, we have traced out some uh, fluctuation in total magnetic field of uh, messenger uh, total magnetic field obtained by uh, magnetometer on board on messenger so in the very first panel you uh, the very first one panel is for uh, the distance of messenger spacecraft from the um, mercury and uh, from the second panel you can clearly see the whenever the um space craft near to the magnetosphere of mercury it shows some peak every time here and here but uh, here with the peak after this peak there are some in, uh, some fluctuation in magnetic field total magnetic field as well as in uh, the component and these signatures can be traced out as a shock associated with the these mars cme and uh, uh, additionally we we can see the rotation here in total magnetic field there are one component of a uh, magnetic field so these uh, signatures can be traced out as a magnetic cloud within this ice cream. next move on to the venus as we know that uh, venus hasn't uh, an intrinsic magnetic field and uh, but but when the solar wind interact with the ionosphere of venus uh, it uh, it uh, it behave it uh, uh, it makes a induced uh, magnetic field and it uh, which has uh, all the uh, behave as, as a Uh, intrinsic magnetic field so here when this is i mean uh, here the, after the 13 hour of uh, occurrence of cme we can see some shock signature at uh, as in the in, uh, as uh, in the increment of total magnetic field and their components 
So these are the uh, signatures at Venus, and we have traced out uh, these signatures of, uh, observed by the magnetometer on board of Venus Express. So the northeast segment of uh, uh, this Mars CME was interacted with the uh, COB after the 24 hour, and uh, here we can um, we can trace out these signatures as the enhancement in total magnetic field their uh, component of magnetic field and the velocity of solar wind. So, next, when, when we come into the Earth, so after 30 hours of uh, the occurrence of CM, uh, these CMEs, we have some increment in uh, almost all parameters of solar wind as well as in the interplanetary medium, uh, interplanetary magnetic field. So, these signatures, uh, here I want to mention that these, uh, these in enhancement in the in solar wind and magnetic field parameters it is because of the CME2, not the CME1, as I mentioned in uh, earlier slide. So uh, these are the, this is the signature of shock, and there's a turbulence in all parameters of solar wind. So this is a, this can be traced as a sheet sheet reason, and then uh, the signature of ice uh, mass ejection here during the uh, ICME the the systematic horizontal component of uh, Earth's magnetic field uh, goes down and, uh, and reach of the minimum uh, DST value of minus so 148 nanotesla here. Next, come to the Mars. And uh, in 2012, uh, the Ma Mars uh, Express was uh, on Mars and uh, it hasn't any magnetic uh, magnetometer. Uh, so the study of uh, these uh, is to study the imprints of Mars at the, uh, of these uh, ICMEs is little difficult. Is little difficult and uh, also a little difficult as we are tracing it out uh, for the other uh, planets. So as we haven't any magnetometer here on Mars that time, so we have traced it out uh, as in uh, traced it out the signature of ICME as in the enhancement of electron uh, electron energy. And it is offered by ALS spectrogram on uh, of Mars Express. And here, uh, at, on uh, 9th and 10th of March, we can clearly see the enhancement in electron energy here, uh, here and here. And these can be traced it out as an imprint of uh, uh, these IC, Mars ICMEs here. So, uh, so these are the observation and observed time, what we have. Uh, what we have get from the observations and uh, the space gap. Uh, so to uh, justify their idea, we have the WSC analytic hole model here. And uh, in the diet, you can uh, see this is the density uh, density distribution, and the color bar is showing the distribution parameter here. And sorry, and uh, this uh, this cloud section, cloud like structure, this is the CM1. And uh, the uh, symbols here, the color symbol, uh, they uh, indicate different uh, planets and uh, cards here. So this is Earth, Mars, uh, Mercury, and Messenger, Venus, Studio B, and Studio A here. So uh, when we calculated uh, the arrival time with this uh, WSL cone model, so we have seen that uh, the observed time of uh, ICMEs was a little earlier. And we have got uh, average time error for all uh, those five locations uh, is about uh, around 4.5, 4 4.6 uh, hour. So uh, we can assume uh, we can assume that these uh, time error is because of uh, the acceleration we got after the uh, interaction with each other. So as a result, through the summary. Uh, Within an hour, the two CME started at the 0024 UT and 0130 UT on March 7th of uh, 2012. Uh, has a particular benefit of measurement from three different viewpoints and five in situ observations, two of uh, which are the almost readily aligned, which is Earth and Mars, and uh, longitudinally separated by the 70, uh, 70 degree from the other three spacecraft. Uh, we were able to investigate the development of these twin CME in the inner hemisphere thanks to this unparalleled data collection. In contrast of period research, this study conclude and prove the results obtained uh, by Rollet et al. 
2014, most of 2014, and uh, that's of course uh, 2016. Uh, that the result is uh, the CME2 was earth directed, not the CME1. And uh, an ICME uh, uh, that we are the twin ICME uh, get uh, when they reach up at the earth, they have raised a geometric storm with a DST value of minus 148 Tesla. We have justified the occurrence and the arrival of these CMEs with the WSA annual core model. And uh, uh, we have predicted that uh, we have calculated the arrival, uh, arrival, uh, the arrival time error about 4.6 hours. So that's it uh, for myself. These are the references for this work. And thank you for your attention. I would be happy if you have any, uh, I would be happy to answer if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for also keeping well within time. So we have uh, time for a few questions. I uh, may request uh, people to just uh, post your question either in the chat box or you can raise your hand and I can request the organizers to unmute yourself. I'm still waiting for the uh, questions in the chat box. Yeah, Tibindu, go ahead and... Okay. Hi, Shush, uh, that, that was a nice, nice talk. Um, I was particularly uh, kind of intrigued by the way you were comparing uh, the morphology of uh, the interaction of CMEs, uh, shockwaves with uh, the magnetospheres of planets, which have intrinsic uh, magnetospheres and which have uh, sort of imposed magnetospheres. And as you rightly pointed out, to in many extents, the, the imposed magnetosphere almost acts like an like a, a intrinsic magnetosphere um, because the, the external weak magnetic field is actually projected and, and acts like an umbrella in the, in the, in the sun side. But there is a critical difference in the magnetic topology between intrinsic and extrinsic magnetospheres, which is at the poles. Uh, it says that in, in every intrinsic magnetosphere, the, the global field lines will always converge uh, into the polar regions, whereas for externally imposed magnetosphere, mm -hmm. that doesn't happen. So I wonder uh, uh, if there are satellites which orbit, uh, you know, I mean, of course, Earth will have those measurements, but for Mars and and, uh, and Venus, the, the satellites which, which go around, where you're sampling the polar regions as well as the sun side, the day side, Mm -hmm. In a way that one can bring out uh, whether this difference in magnetic topology of the magnetosphere have an impact in in how space weather is channeled down to uh, to the inner atmosphere in those planets. Okay, sir. So, uh, so the clarify. I'm one sorry, was if it's too complex uh, or too long. No, no. Okay, sir. Actually, uh, when we are tracing out uh, when studying this event, so uh, so we are just concerning for. That uh, if if there is any uh, disturbances in magnetic field and their component or not, we are just trying to uh, trying to see that there, is there any um, signature of the interaction of these CME events with the uh, with the planets or the spacecraft. So for that, we have uh, we have we tried to trace out their orbit when they are when they are uh, near to this uh, planet or not. So. So, as I'm not very uh, very expert in this uh, microspheric structure and uh, field, so yeah, for this study we have uh, taken care of this. But, uh, but yeah. No, maybe maybe in the future this is a good line to explore. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was a good talk. Thanks, Thanks Shish. I guess the show will also answer some of the this question in the presentation. We cannot actually, he's doing very different things. So let me uh, ask you one thing, uh, Shish. Uh, you mentioned about these two CMEs. So this two CME interaction part, you have not uh, really uh, looked at all possibilities because you mentioned also the arrival time uh, uh, was not absolutely right and you expect that, you know, maybe once CME was accelerated, but what is your impression about, uh, you know, how it will get accelerated by the CME? And do you have any thought process on that? Uh, 
Actually, sir, uh, we can do that with the uh, with uh, multiple viewpoints. If we have, uh, as we can see it by stereo, this event we can trace it out with the stereo uh, A and B and lasso. So if we if we can trace out with the inner holes for our system, so after the interaction, uh, if the one CME has a different uh, speed and other CME was different speed, and when they got interact, uh, so after the image of uh, after the interaction image, we can trace out and with the high time profile, we can clearly uh, justify the results of exploration after the interaction. I was just wondering if there is any theoretical understanding also about this exchange uh, the process in terms of yes, one. Sir. There are lots of paper on it, like after the interaction. Yes, she has uh, hand, so maybe Nandita has an answer. Please go ahead, Nandita. No, uh, it was not an answer. It was a continuation of your question. Uh, I think since it is uh, it is uh, happening in within one hour, yes. uh, I don't think you need to do a lot of uh, 3D reconstruction because it is interacting very close to the sun itself within an hour. So, so uh, and you yourself mentioned that it is a merged CME. So, uh, so it it is it will have one uh, one velocity only after. And after, the after uh, means the the way you are three, doing three D reconstruction, you will be able to get only one velocity unless you try to do you know for different angles uh, of position angles for the three D reconstruction. So in that sense, I think four hours is not a, a big uh, deal. I mean, it's not an error in my opinion. The NLL itself gives a lot of errors within plus minus 12 hours or so. So you don't have to worry about that. But my concern is whether um, whether uh, both of these CMEs have uh, have reached all the spacecrafts as you mentioned, and which part which part of it is reaching there that may have an error because somewhere you will have the nose of the CME and other places you will have the plank. So you will definitely have a lag between them, even yeah. if it's one CME. If yeah, it's thank you very much, much for a lively discussion. I think I will uh, request both of you to continue the discussion yes. in the chat box. And uh, should we? Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm enjoying that, you know, uh, the interactions which is happening in the chat box also. So please do participate and uh, make it uh, even more vital. Shobik, can you please go ahead and share your screen and present your talk? First of all, uh, it might show not my in the uh, attendees link. Uh, this is the um, app. Uh, it's PS3, PS1 in the probably because I was trying to get my personal ID. Somehow I can't, so I'm using the, my volunteers. I please ask and hear. Go ahead. You have a double hand to wear now. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. So, from Vic Roy, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're talking about estimating stratospheric currents and effectiveness of interplanetary CMEs with magnetic simulations. And this talk is supervised by uh, Nandi from uh, CCI. Uh, let me give you a let me give you an overview of. Uh, so I'm going to uh, talk about the geomagnetic impacts of the star and how we model uh, such solar storms and geomagnetosphere uh, using SESI storm induction module or STORMI, uh, which we have developed in SESI. And I'll show you uh, the results of STORMI, uh, the evolution of the magnetosphere, the induced current around Earth, and most importantly, prediction of geoeffectiveness uh, from STORMI. And then I'll conclude. So as we all know that uh, the, the upper corona, uh, which is basically uh, moving away from the sun to the helium the solar wind, has an inbuilt uh, uh, magnetic fields and which shapes our, our magnetosphere to a well-known teardrop kind of shape. But this is, not, uh, this is not the case always because there are storms. The storms have uh, the uh, near death magnetic field of art. Uh, most importantly, the uh, mass change of CMEs at one end, or we see them as coronal mass ejections or CMEs, uh, has a, a huge impact on geomagnetic. 
and to understand and model, mo and model such impacts, we we uh, mo created a module at uh, CC. Uh, so we used magnetohydrodynamic uh, plasma uh, in uh, architecture, and then and uh, we assumed uh, that it's a far far out architect, so that we don't have to think about the plan, uh, the start or the sun itself. And uh, the planet has an intrinsic di dipolar planetary uh, magnetic field. Uh, and our uh, stellar wind is a magnetized shock. And the whole system is non relativistic, compressible magnetic fluid, and with high magnetic Reynolds number. So, uh, here in this cartoon, uh, you can see how we uh, model the interplanetary coronal mass ejection uh, in the NAT domain of Earth. Uh, we uh, we really take a Cartesian domain around Earth and our uh, Fraxo, which is basically a cylindrical gold hull type Fraxo, enters that domain with no axial curvature, so it's complete cylindrical, uh, pure cylindrical. I must say uh, the Fraxo expansion is as negligible due to rotation because Earth is like uh, uh, really the time span is really small considering the whole length scale of the uh, ICME. Uh, the flux rope is to the ecliptic plan, uh, so the core passes through Earth, uh, which is not the case uh, because it can, uh, can go to any possible direction from the sun. And uh, initial magnetosphere is a steady state in our simulation, which means that when the Earth touches the, the magnetosphere, the dipole magnetosphere of the Earth is already uh, shaped by a uh, solar wind, SIMF solar wind in this particular case. So uh, let's move to the temporal evolution of the magnetosphere. As you can see, the initial dipolar magnetic field is shaped to the known teardrop shaped magnetosphere. This is because of the SIMF. Now the ICM enters in the domain and completely changes everything. So the current system modifies the magnetotail gets torsionality. And uh, there is huge decadence uh, happens in the day side as well as at the night side. And since the SIMF use was uh, the initial magnetic field, uh, solar will be choose as SIMF, and uh, the uh, so it has a decided magnet um, uh, reconnection region, and that current uh, very much uh, increase day side magnetosphere current because of the ICM heating. So, let's do an interesting result, I must say. Uh, it's magnetospheric induced current and the geomagnetic in this. So, although we are dealing with complete fluid and it's no in our space, but we are seeing that the induced current around this is the left, right, the current system, the equatorial plane of Earth. So, we can see a uh, uh, pointer. Yeah. So, you can see a uh, uh, fluid uh, induced current around the earth and the current direction uh, plotted with the arrows and the magnitude of current is in the mirror. So you can see that the, the current basically matching the real life particle currents around the earth. So uh, as we know that the ring current has a direct input in the geomagnetic indices, we have tried to predict the geomagnetic indices using the current that we are doing uh, in our simulation. And how we are doing that? So let me give you a quick overview of geomagnetic indices. Geomagnetic indices are basically calculated from ground-based magnetometers. Uh, ground-based magnetometers measure the disturbance uh, in terms of horizontal magnetic field of Earth, uh, H. So uh, as the uh, magnetic disturbance increases, uh, so the particle and uh, more inject inject to the Earth uh, uh, within magnetosphere of Earth. So the ring current increases. And as uh, as high the ring current, then we got the field, so then indice goes negative. So in uh, our work, we consider uh, indices mainly the DX distance storm time index and the symmetric symmetry index. And what we uh, did was we uh, so in this particular presentation, I'm going to uh, show you a proof of concept study. For the 20th November 2003 solar storm, it has a uh, it had a severe geomagnetic impact. So, 
this uh, this is the uh, uh, profile of the incoming wind uh, i take omni data so see the magnetic field profile and the ramp uh, pressure profile of the of that uh, that event and we uh, basically identify the initial solar wind forcing the shift region the flux slope region and the later uh, slmf forcing uh, and then we model our flux slope uh, using gold hull model based on these regions and we we performed the simulation and this was the equatorial current so uh, you can see the this this particular axis is the rotation axis of the earth and this is our uh, equatorial current and we have a uh, huge current uh, as a ring around earth and we use the bayer law to calculate what is the uh, how the uh, magnetic uh, how the magnetic field is created because of this induced and then we plot it with the actual uh, index the dst and symmetry index so let me show you the results directly okay so this particular red curve is index of the same event and this blue curve is the symmetry h index uh, uh the dst index is hourly based and the symmetry index is minute based so you can say that uh, so they are almost uh, uh you can say the averaged out dst index is almost near i mean you can consider it as an averaged out uh, symmetric h index though it's not actually and then the purple line is the induced magnetic field that we calculated using this so now this tells us two things that we got almost the, the maximum almost uh, matching with the with the actual event so the time we got maximum impact almost matching with the actual event not only that we have seen another uh, interesting thing that is uh, we have also plotted the magnetospheric the maximum magnetospheric current so we saw that when the maximum of the magnetospheric current, uh, the magnetospheric current goes maximum the geomagnetic indices we related uh, our reduced magnetic field goes uh, minimum so the uh, indices also in it like so uh, we are currently uh, uh, we are currently uh, uh, trying to communicate our results and uh, so and another thing is we have done a statistical correlation also uh, based on our observed and index so uh, we have tried to fit that how the model data and the observed uh, observed values and the model values uh, uh, are are they linear or not so we have seen uh, yes they are quite linear so the person coefficient for dst is 0.85 with 99.9% uh, confidence and symmetric h is 0.88 with 99.99 confidence uh, though i must say that we have uh, various scope to uh, to upgrade the system and, and to put another uh, other few effects but uh, this is uh, uh, this is to some extent we can correlate that uh, when we can we can get a maximum impact uh, for a icm event so let me conclude by saying that understanding the geomagnetic impact solar storms can uh, build the causal connection solar and geomagnetic events which we are trying uh, using our storm model our module can help predict the impact of solar storm in our atmosphere uh, we, are, uh, we are trying to develop our predicting module also uh, we can predict the occurrence time of the magnetospheric current enhancement so we uh, we can also qualitatively estimate magnetic indices and the prediction can be compared to the atmospheric current measurements and it can complement the ground based parameter networks so that all on my side uh, thank you thank you very much for completing well within time we have a good amount of actually for questions and discussions those hand is uh, technical ankush bhaskar is not able to join because of some technical reasons so i would first uh, request the uh, people to have questions for for shobhik and uh, post shobhik's questions we can also take questions for other speakers in this session you can also raise your hand option or, or type your question in the chat box
I haven't seen yet any questions. Uh, and the participants uh, window need to be tracked. No, there is tensors. So uh, also, Rick, how much in magnitude does the ring current change from the day side to the night side? Did you hear my question and uh, all of this question? Should I repeat? Um, okay. I mean, should I repeat the question? Yeah, let me try again. Uh, the question is how much in magnitude does the ring current change from the day side to the night side? Yeah, so night side is quite uh, higher from the day side. Uh, and which is supposed to be, uh, but, uh, but I have not explored how much is the magnitude, but it, it is higher, it is much higher. Okay, are there any other questions uh, for Ruby? Yes, there are a little more time. So you did mention about your, you know, a basic uh, equation from your MHG. Uh, but would you like to say a little more about your model in, uh, in particular? I mean, just for the sake of uh, discussions, I am posing this question because suppose you know, uh, from the Pluto, how is it different your model? So uh, it is based on Pluto. Uh, so we are basically using the Pluto architecture. So the MHD that we are solving in our computational box is solved by Pluto. So what? So what we are doing is we are developing the computational box. We are using how the boundary condition will be, and we are choosing to be the computational size and every details inside the computational box is of us. But the basic MHD is solved by Pluto. Based on our version um, and the, the uh, solver, the, uh, the divergence conditions that we have uh, this uh, 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 authority to choose Pluto. So we choose them. Pluto has solved the regulations. What about the Can I clarify on that? Because I don't think Shobhi gave a complete answer uh, to the question. Since we have a lot of time. Yes. So what Pluto is, is just any other solver. The solver for equations and in this case it turns out to be MHG equations. However, Pluto doesn't have a, have a art, it doesn't have a magnetosphere. Pluto doesn't know what a sun is, it neither, it doesn't, neither does it know what a solvent shock wave is. So this is what I mean by a module. So when you do a module, you, you have all the equations of course, when every board solves the equation, but it will provide everything. So for example, Pluto doesn't intrinsically have an earth. It doesn't intrinsically have an atmosphere and a magnetosphere, right? So we have to construct uh, and place an earth with appropriate boundary conditions, atmosphere, magnetosphere, and a dipolar magnetic field emanating from it within that system. Then the solar wind, if you want to treat the solar wind, the solar wind has to be incorporated as a shock wave, which Pluto will not do for you, which means that now you have to work out the hagenal conditions and incorporate them and move, have it move as a shock through your system, right? CMEs are one step uh, evolved from there because right now you just you don't have a simple shock wave moving through a deformed shock wave moving through. You have a flux loop which is uh, moving at a super speed. So now you provide a, a, a magnetic field profile which you know follows either some language kind of flux loop or, or some other kind of flux loop. So those are the, the modular elements you put together in a system to make it a model for the sun earth system kind of thing. So those are the things that we put together. And for which we need a specialized expert. For example, somebody working on as Pluto is widely used in Australia. Right. But somebody working on jets from Black is not necessarily this uh, sun earth system unless they spend some significant amount of time to understand that. So that's where most of the effort goes in, in terms of building a module. But I think to have some like a Pluto uh, code, which is a common architecture for solving any problem in a machine, 
is a great thing uh, because you know it, it invites this philosophy of open source sort of thing where uh, we hope that some of the work we are doing will all if you also become part of our this while this and all will become part of the open source software movement but let me ask, ask this. so you are treating this as a shock so does it mean also you don't have any dissipation or anything in the system right oh we have dissipation of course there is there is, uh, there is dissipation i see okay yeah so you can is, uh, the energy exchanges and all that yeah it's a complete full efficiency so yes okay. okay that's good and you have adaptive mesh also um we can have adaptive mesh but you have not switched it on that's because we are only doing the under box near the sun. If we start doing very wide domains, then you have to do adaptive mesh to be able to do it well within a you know some reasonable computational time. But I mean, particularly as you said, you know, near the atmosphere, the interaction region, and all that, you have to think about you know better mesh. Right. So if you are, for example, looking at individual flux transfer events like all the people looking at. Hmm. You better have adaptive mesh because then it's suddenly coming from the global global system to a very small one, yes, yes. and you want to resolve that, right? So, so yeah, so there like, the adaptive mesh becomes very important. But we have very modest computational facilities. When you get reference report, it takes six months for us to do the simulations to address the reference report. Uh, so, you know, I, I guess I'm working on the strategy. <laughs> yeah, yeah the one question uh, uh, Jack Bob, uh, let me pose that. Zwil uh, Sheikh is asking, uh, what is the particle composition you have taken to calculate the ring current and what causes the decay of ring current in your simulation? Okay, so, uh, yeah, uh, so first of all, uh, we don't have the actual ring current, like the particle ring current, as I mentioned in our side, what we have is an induced current. So induced, induced plasma current because of the magnetic field, and we calculated that from the uh, equation Carl uses to lose the J. There is no particle involved, but if you, uh, if you have input, then you know that uh, by, uh, by uh, initializing the plasma, you have to give uh, a certain number density of the plasma. So then you can say that uh, all uh, in our, our system, the plasma is hydrogen, hydrogen like plasma. And uh, so, and then another thing that what causes the decay of ring current in a real life decay of ring current, uh, the particle ring current has uh, as multiple uh, reasons. Uh, um, we can't blame any one particular reason for the decay of ring current. There are he, uh, there are two three reasons the decay of ring current happens in real life. But in our case, we have not seen uh, a younger decay of ring current. Our decay of ring current is as quick as there is a uh, generation of uh, increase in the ring current, which is basically because we don't have the kinematic things, you know, we don't have particles there. Yeah. So, so uh, it is not actually, you can't actually compare the particle uh, ring current phenomena with our system. We just have to, we just had to uh, estimate the uh, the effectiveness from the current induced current we are getting in the in the ring current region of Earth. Yes, I mean it's MHD, so uh, particle composition doesn't have much meaning here actually. Yeah, Nandita, you have please go ahead, please go ahead and ask your question. Uh, I, I I just wanted to say it's a good thing to have your own model. So you already have done this. Uh, I wanted to ask this one, how does it compare with the other models that are predicting DST index? Uh, because you have made the correlation coefficient and compare the thing. So one is that. Other is uh, whether you get the sudden storm commandment also in the uh, thing. When you're talking about the shock, I thought uh, it might also be reproduced, no? Do no, you get we, that? We have not uh, worked on sudden storm commitment, but uh, we have planned to do that. So in the analysis part, but uh, if you want to, if you want the comparison result, yes, there are certain ones uh, uh, which calculate DHDX directly from the ring current measurement, and then there are some using artificial intelligence. So they also have the correlation factor between eight to eight to nine. Uh, I have not seen any model more than nine on. Yeah. So uh, almost. So it is well within that. Okay. 
uh, every, uh, but the thing is, uh, if you if you have seen the the presentation, uh, uh, although the, the initial conditions. So actually, I missed the beginning part of it. So maybe oh, I didn't. So one one more important thing is the initialization of the CME because in our case the CME is directly hitting the art, but in real life it not we, the art is not directly crossing the center of the ICME. So there are some things that that may improve our result also. But Randita, I'll, I'll, I'll put a word of caution here. I think I will still say empirical models, artificial intelligence or machine learning models, which are based on CME speed and BZ and DST, are at this stage better than such models. We are trying to make the first steps towards a predictive MHD model. The other groups, like the Michigan group, are also working on this. The one group at Nagoda. So I think there's four or five groups who are working on this. Um, the reason that people don't use such models, in principle, you know, if you if we could have predicted BZ perfectly, uh, we would probably, you know, get uh, like NASA would give us a right. Uh, we are not yet there, and so therefore, I think right now, uh, there are various assumptions, and I don't know things perfect, right? Still at some level idealization. So I think we still have a long way to go. We have come a long way. We can do this to begin with, but I think still a long way to, to make this realistic, um, uh, where you can claim that this is doing better than knowing. I know the PC already uh, for multiple events, and then I do the correlation with DST. I think those are going to be still better. You will find. Mm -hmm. One here is you get to know the physics. Um, yeah. The physics becomes clear to you. Why is you know? The cost of the connection and of course, sometime you hope that it you know, can be made into successful models in the next four or five years. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Shubhi, uh, I think uh, we have some more time as uh, Push uh, couldn't join. So I will take this opportunity to also have a question for Navita and uh, Arghodi who gave the talk, first two talks. So, Nandita also missed uh, most of our event. The problem is uh, there's so many talks going on in solar and astronomy session also, actually. Right? I'm shuttling between the two. Uh, it's nice. You are the organizer. You should have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm actually still listening to talks, by the way, because I'm still working on actually handling the back end, which is nice. Um, but Nandita, let me ask you. Um, Deepankar is also here. I think Deepankar is also important. So, <laughs> We are perhaps going to get the NST, uh, the way things are, are looking at this point in time, based on uh, what has happened already, based on the current recommendations of the Megavision Committee of the Principal Scientific Advisor, which many of us are part of. Um, do you think that it's a bit too late? Uh, and we should really have been probably aiming for something like four meter class. Uh, What's your perspective? Because it, it is being made to appear that, okay, solar, solar physics have not got in a long time. So here is, it is a two meter class telescope. But, but do you think we should really be thinking beyond that even to at this point in time? Or do you think, what do you think? I mean, I just want to kind of get both you and the workers feeling on that because we are, we are here and <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, uh, uh, two things, you know, we always uh, need to take a step one at a time. And the telescope is already a big step. Because currently we have the biggest telescope for ground-based solar facilities at a half meter. So I don't, uh, I don't think we can go to Fortel at any time. So uh, one at a time. So uh, step two is quite a big step. And what I understand, my feeling is uh, the two meter class telescope at this part of the, you know, uh, taking the location advantage uh, of uh, being in India uh, will already a bit step forward. And if you can coordinate certain things with, uh, with a, you know, a DS, and even if you say a ESP, uh, that's probably 10 years uh, at least down the line, mm -hmm. even 15 years. Uh, it has not made uh, in much progress than that. So, uh, in a big way, NLST has a different, uh, you know, uh, uh, still, if we can get it uh, in a reasonable amount of time. 2027, 2028. 
So if we can get it done within a reasonable amount of time for next year, you know, generation, I would say, will it will you know give you a lot of important signs. People will get used to ground-based high-resolution observation. This has not happened actually. To be honest, you know, MUST is also a very modest uh, telescope which really doesn't do an exposure of a real high-resolution observation. What we are talking about. Because uh, at least a one and a half meter class telescope is existing for you know more than a decade now, okay. and Indians uh, have not got direct uh, you know access to the ground based facility. In fact, to be honest, Indians have been working with space based uh, you know quality data for last two decades. Other other other, is, other countries for a long time. No, even Indians. You see, by, by no, no, I'm Indians are working with space data data for a long time. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So this question uh, also applies to Aditya. And that's the same thing. Aditya also is. Yes, that's what said, I wanted to say. We should, we should have got it like ten years before. Yes, yeah. yes. We should already be starting to think so that ahead, so that we are not so late for for future missions like this. That's, I think we are a bit late of the of the boat, both for Aditya and. Which doesn't necessarily make this missions any less important, but I think it would have been very nice if both of this were there at least ten years, five years back. Mm-hmm. And so, therefore, perhaps should all, you know, while the work on this is ongoing, should perhaps also start thinking of the next missions in a big way and starting about you know, start talking about this to ISRO and the larger community. So that's how you. So in any any case, the sites are different, and we are like one eighty degrees apart. So we still have a you know we are complementing each other, and the field of view may be a little larger for NLSD. Am I correct? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's but it's, it's uh, so yeah. larger than right. than it ESD. Is. So. Right. So that complementarity also is there. In fact, just yeah. uh, thanks to for pointing this out. You see, with DKS, you cannot even cover an active region. Yes, exactly. Uh, right. You focus on one sunspot, but you you don't see the other sunspot within an active region. To see here the dynamics of even if you say you know space weather, you know really high resolution, uh, uh, you know kind of. Well, Sita has a hand raised, I think. Uh, yeah, Sita has. Yes, yes. Okay, I'm here. Uh, this is regarding our. Hello, can you hear? Yes. Yes. Yeah. This is regarding our part. You were Anita was talking about part which are about observations of switchbacks. Just want to know about the ground or surface signatures. Any surface, any relationship between any surface feature to the switchbacks? Yeah. Uh, people have done. They have looked at the super granulation boundary where they think the the comes from. So, just um, close to that, uh, if they have a closed field line and the open field line from the funneling of this thing, they can uh, come together and uh, create a reconnection, and that would lead lead to some kind of uh, you know kink in the magnetic field line. So, there, this is one theory. There is some other theory also, which I I don't remember, but there is another theory which says which probably says that these switchbacks happen in the in the outer uh, corona, I mean, not in close to the surface. So these kind of tests we can do with our um, ground-based instruments because those we, we can see the super dense and things so, with analyst. For example, a gong will help us. Or? Gong will not help us because it is very uh, it is full disk and it is low resolution. Must can help us, but not, but we don't have such a good sight to see the super granules. So you have to have a very good sight, like uh, I'm. I'm presuming Mera would do this. Would help us in this. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So we still have five minutes uh, before we uh, uh, formally do have a break. But uh, are there some questions from other attendees? Please take this opportunity to post questions to Nandita. Or uh, you know, uh, or the who has been in it, and also Shish, uh, Dr. Suni. We can take that question again. Yeah, I must compliment uh, you know to and uh, you know uh, IT uh, group uh, uh, for you know setting up this kind of simulation uh, which was uh, missing in the country for many many years. And I think it's it's very important. 
and uh, I hope that this will really uh, bring a new momentum and uh, we need to have many more people <laughs> working on this kind of uh, large scale yeah. simulation. <laughs> I now have a student from who, who graduated from IIT in Lord. He he did his master and he is very much into simulations. So uh, I think he will continue to do his PhD in that field. So I have to learn away from him. Yeah, <laughs> long time Nandita, you have not visited. Come yes. <laughs> In a small way, we have also initiated, Viva had rather initiated. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. 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 yeah, so good that, you know. Yeah. I think this is, a, this is very good. I think we need to have this for, historically for a very long time. Indians have somehow not excelled in modeling and simulations, or the field has not been entered very much. I think there's a problem both ways, which I intended. I have talked about this a lot to the state, this was anywhere with them. Uh, we are uh, uh, the Begavishan document which has been done in the KSA. Uh, I think there is this interesting recognition happening in various institutions, which I think is a good good thing. Uh, where I think uh, ISRO missions uh, are going to gain out of this modeling stuff. Um, also, academic institutions, if they can collaborate with observers in, in other observational institutions or ISRO centers. Which I think is something that happens a lot in other countries. It's something that doesn't happen very well here. Uh, that, I think that, that ground level, grassroots level, talking to each other and collaborations, I think it happened in our generation. I think there's a lot of positivity. Yeah. And I see this uh, sort of encouraging each other, which I think is something that is very nice. Uh, and I hope that gives us the momentum to kind of chill out. Then this observers, instrument specialists, and modelers together uh, and come up with more compelling proposals as well as science. Thank you, Mr. Ribirindu, for participating in this session also. And and I don't think you lose me uh, 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 all the time, but I think a lot of young people are talking, and a lot of modern tasks are close to my heart. So. Uh, there are a lot of good talks in the previous presentations, which is unfortunate. But uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you for the uh, hosting. You know, I agree to moderate. I think it's a tough job, but uh, uh, but it's good for the field that the ministry people have taken this responsibility and the load to to give voice to the younger generation. So thank you very much, Dipanka, Dita, and others also. Yeah, so thanks to all the speakers in this session. I think it's time now we can take a couple of minutes extra. Uh, so let us break now and we will rejoin at uh, 4 30. And uh, Shatish, take over uh, the chair manager. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, all the speakers and participants. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your help. Uh, thanks, Smita. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So we uh, log out or next session is at four. Yeah, that's in this same link, no? So we can keep it on. Same link at four thirty. Okay.